All right, well, good evening, everybody. I've, um, I've been asked to uh, talk about how to establish a thermoplasty program. We've um, uh, entered into thermoplasty about a month after approval at the University of Chicago and have been going full steam ahead um, since then and wanted to talk about our experience about <clears throat> running the center, our patient selection process, and how to ultimately, if you will, uh, sort of market yourself to make it happen. Um, so this will be our agenda. We already know what thermoplasty is, but um, one of the things that I will stress, because this is the patient selection process, so these are the folks that are arriving to your clinic, and the number of people who have been sent to us for thermoplasty versus the number of people that we're going to consider doing it on is definitely a, a large, different number. Um, there are people who arrive saying they cannot wait to get rid of their inhalers once they get thermoplasty, because these are the inhalers, by the way, that they're currently not taking anyway. Um, and so it is definitively and it should be reinforced over and over that this is a complementary therapy to the things they currently should be doing and that you are adding to their management and hopefully making their lives better if they're going to then continue on their inhaled steroid labas, et cetera, which then in a controlled scenario will try to wean, et cetera, et cetera, following guidelines. But there's a lot of misperception amongst uh, some of our patients who arrive for consultation. Um, this is the device, and it has been shown to you earlier. Um, this is the disposable catheter that you will be utilizing. Um, if you've ever used foreign body retrieval devices, it looks somewhat similar to that. Um, it is, um, from a deployment perspective, I will tell you, not much more difficult than placing a brush into an airway to take a sample. From the actual procedural aspect of doing thermoplasty, it is relatively straightforward. It's the patient management, I think, that is, would argue is more nuanced. Um, so we go through a pretty vigorous, a rigorous process, um, which I'll take you through here. So our patient selection. So we come, patients who come through our severe asthma clinic are adults with documented diagnosis of severe asthma, and they also have to finish our adherence protocol. So we have a, uh, this is all through the work of Dr. Jerry Krishnan, who's my colleague who runs this clinic. I'm his bronchoscopist, essentially. Jerry has an adherence protocol. He can definitively show with really good evidence that you're actually taking your, in this case, Advair, as opposed to just cocking it and dumping it before arriving in clinic so that the counter actually reads zero. Because um, the first thing in my mind is thermoplasty is indicated for people that are actually taking their inhalers. They also get, ultimately, if they're this severe, they get CT imaging to, be, to make sure there's not another diagnosis. You all have had the same experience I had. This is my bad asthma. It's my bad asthma. It's all, I'm on, on every inhaler. I'm frequently on steroids. And then only to discover it's actually their hypersensitivity pneumonitis or their sarcoidosis, or their vasculitis. Um, we had data we published last year here, or presented last year here at ATS, or I guess down in New Orleans, um, showing the frequency at which we find alternative diagnoses in our severe asthma clinics. Um, per the ATS guidelines, all patients are ultimately tested for alpha-1. They'll get ANCA testing and so forth, looking for other complex asthma syndromes that frequently are not obviously there. And then in the end, they need to be able to undergo a bronchoscopy. That kind of goes without saying. And they can't have been treated prior. So this is a process. It's not, hi, come to clinic, I'll do thermoplasty on you tomorrow. It's come to clinic, go through an extensive evaluation. Probably about a month later is when your first thermoplasty is ultimately going to occur. Um, we obviously do a fully informed patient. We detailed explanation of what's going on. Um, we'll show them a procedure video. Thank goodness for the ability to record your bronx. I keep them on my iPad and my iPhone. Demonstrate to the patient, here's what we're going to do to you. Here's what it looks like. Um, they're all premedicated for three days prior with prednisone. And then, reasons to postpone. These were already brought up earlier. But, you know, if they didn't take their prednisone, if they're desaturating, if they've had a lot of increased asthma symptoms, they're having upper respiratory, all the kind of things. You know, you're already, rightfully so, probably a little bit on the nervous side about doing a bronchoscopy on a severe asthmatic. And when this is a severe asthmatic trending in the wrong direction, listen to what your gut's telling you and abort and come back. They will still be a beneficial thermoplasty candidate a month from now, et cetera. We, our protocol, um, our patients nebulize 1% lidocaine for 10 minutes prior to the procedure. Then as they're being sedated, we start to go into the uh, pharynx and we put 1% lidocaine and 2 ml aliquots directly to the vocal cords, typically 6 to 8 squirts. Then we do a couple more down through the airways and then reapply as needed throughout. Um, we sedate. I argue not that heavily, but some people think it's a lot of dosing, anywhere from 4 to 10 milligrams of midaz, 
and 100 to 200 mics of fentanyl, frequently boosted with a little uh, IV Benadryl for the beneficial effect of, of knocking you out. Um, we've had, this is our standard sedation protocol for every bronchoscopic procedure we do under conscious sedation. Um, that's, that's, that's it. This is what we sedate with, give or take. Um, we've definitely done more, not for thermoplasty, but this is about what we require. Um, we don't give a drying agent. I find it just messes with the secretions more. We just use suction. Um, we just clear out any secretions, and we use a lot of, a lot of topical lidocaine while we're in there if there's any amount of coughing. Um, ultimately, and I want to stress, this is definitely three separate bronchoscopic procedures, and I would make the argument back to this, why we sedate very you know, heavily, if you will. I want this patient to, when they wake up and I say, we're all done, and I'm happy to say that about 95% of the time, the first question they ask me is, when are we going to start? And I say, well, we're done. And that is somebody who will definitely come back for bronchoscopy number two, because they have no idea bronchoscopy number one even occurred. Um, so we do it in three separate procedures. One, minimizing risk of asthma exacerbation. But two, this is a long enough procedure. You're going to push the limits of conscious sedation. So you do it in individual sessions by, by Protocol, we start with the right lower lobe for session one. You come back at least three weeks later. We do the left lower lobe. You come back three weeks later. We do the bilateral upper lobes. The right middle lobe is not treated, and each procedure is definitely less than an hour, and on average, about 60-plus activations of the system, give or take. Depends clearly on the person's individual anatomy. You're going to do the smallest possible airways that you can visibly see. If your scope, if this is a person who's already very narrowed, you're not going to be able to get out as far you're gonna fire it less. If this is someone who's markedly dilated, you can get out further, and you're able to get out to smaller airways, and you can still see your catheter. You're gonna fire it up more. So, what I would tell you, the, 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 the difficulties, if you will, for thermoplasties, or the things to anticipate, the procedure itself, like I said, oops, is not difficult. Um, it is the, you know, the, 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 uh, the actual working of the catheter. What this actually requires you to do is truly and be honest with yourself about your knowledge of airway anatomy and being very meticulous and methodical about mapping out the airways of this patient, because they obviously don't all, they didn't all read the Netter diagram, and making sure that you're going out distally through subsegments, coming back, going to a different subsegment, and then remembering, okay, I am in RB6, and I've done now all of RB6, including all the various. RB6A and B and RB6A12, however far out you could get. And documenting it all and not getting screwed up. Wait, did I, did I do RB7? Uh-oh. It were definitely requires you to be gung-ho about your anatomy. That's probably, quote, the only difficulty. Because depending on the type of bronchoscopies you do and have done, you don't always have to be so religious about your anatomy. Here you have to, because you want to get sequential activations on all visible airways. Um, it's a great little drill to go and, you know, basically uh, you're working with fellows to really ram the anatomy home into them. Um, the technique then, we go and take a look at what we did before. It always honestly pretty much looks like normal airway. Um, we then plan the order in which we're going to do it. So you can just be, do it one way, the same way every time. Go clockwise, go counterclockwise, your choice. Work from distal to proximal, top right to bottom left, whatever. Just do it the same way every time and use that map to then plan and track progression. So this is an example, maybe. Catheter's being deployed out, distally obviously, to the limits of what they're ultimately gonna be able to see, spread out, and then. Yeah, I will be in your dreams. Um, so then it's just backed up. Obviously, that's where the markings were. You get the next sequential activation. And you'll notice the whole time, you know, basically, you're just doing this. You back it up a little bit, and you do this again. Reasons ultimately to terminate. We've not, I, I, we have not personally had to terminate a procedure. Maybe others in the audience have had. No, Mario hasn't. Terry? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. But if, I mean, just the typical logic, um, you look in the airways are just getting very edematous and inflamed. The patient's just not, you know, seems not to be doing well from an airway perspective. Or that you see massive bronchoconstriction going on. Um, or if you get in and then, you know, you wanted to 
uh, you're worried, you know, the area that you did before suddenly looks all uh, disastrous, or that there's a lot of mucus and plugging, etc. I think, you know, this has to obviously be written up here, but on one level it's sort of logical. You get in there and you, wow, this guy's just not doing well. Wow, it looks really ugly in here. And wow, I'm just getting really nervous about my patient. And you know what? Get out. You can always go back two weeks later. Now, post-procedure. Um, and I, sh I should say that one of the things that will happen as you, as you do more bronchoscopies on asthmatics, you'll actually find that the actual procedure, I'll, I'll tell you anecdotally, because we, we bronch all of our asthmatics as part of our severe asthma clinic. And so all of our asthmatics at our clinic ultimately undergo a, a, a diagnostic bronchoscopy. And um, so we've been doing bronchs on asthmatics for a long time. And um, so we're quite comfortable with it. But um, it's the recovery period that's always a little more dicey, if you will. You have, of course, just irritated the airway of a severe asthmatic. So you can imagine, then you want to monitor them a little more closely. And this is actually where you know, your, your post-procedure care, your post-procedure nurses, et cetera, are always good at taking care of your patients. But you kind of want to warn them, hey, I want you to watch this guy ever so slightly closer. You know, this is not just someone who, if their sats go down a little bit, you can just let it ride out. I actually want to be called about it. So standard recovery, obviously. The treated area of the lung will typically reveal some amount of wheezing. We give them albuterol nebs, Q1 hour post-procedure. As Mario had said, and Jerry said as well, the discharge, we measure their FEV once pre and then post. We want to see that it gets back up to 80% of the pre-procedure value, that you've tolerated this well. And they're obviously going to take their oral corticosteroid. We give them all Tylenol post-procedure and six hours later uh, just to help prevent any amount of uh, post-bronchoscopy um, uh, fevers. Uh, we contact them to make sure everything's doing okay. They come back to clinic a couple weeks later, seeing how they're doing before we shoot up the next uh, bronchoscopy. We consider admission if we see significant cough persisting beyond the two hours post. If the FEV1 continues to be reduced, there's hypoxemia, tachycardia, mental status is off. If there's any amount of hemoptysis that's significant, they're requiring lots of bronchodilators. Again, this is the kind of stuff, if someone, this is the guy presenting to your ER, this would be your probably criteria for admission anyway. So there's nothing special here, would be my opinion. Short-term safety was already talked about. We know they're going to do slightly worse post-procedure. You have just aggravated their asthma. And the most common symptoms were airway irritation and asthma symptomatology. Um, it's the post, after all the procedure period, as the AIR-2 trial showed, where you're seeing all the immediate benefits. So how to build this program, it's definitely a definitive team approach between the bronchoscopy program and then a severe asthma clinic. And if you represent both, then play nice with yourself. Um, access uh, to severe asthma patients. So how do you get these guys? You need to go out, and honestly, you need to pitch what you're doing. We spent a lot of time talking to every one of the uh, referring clinics in our area, out of state as well. Talk to the local news media. Thermoplasty makes great news. Your local news, you know, ABC, NBC, whatever, they love this stuff. They get to call it all kinds of fun names. They has, it's great video. There's always some success story of a patient who's going to be on TV saying how my life is better, blah, 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 all because of Dr. Hogarth, blah, you know. Voila, everyone's calling you. And so take advantage of it. But the other thing is, right now, because even though it's approved, approved is not always insured, right? So how do, we've had a really great run of getting people to pay for this. And how have we been able to do that? Well, one, of course, we use the reimbursement group that, that you'll hear about, but that comes with, uh, it's a, a program that's being, uh, you'll give more details, but essentially, I'm not on the phone. I fill out a form, and someone's awful job is to talk to insurance companies all day. Not mine. Because if you expect me to be on the phone with an insurance company all day, it ain't happening. And so... The fight the good fight is more what we do of our documentation. The reason we've been successful is we have extensive clinical documentation of severity of asthma, impact on life, admissions, quality of life reduction, the amount of times they're going to the ER. We have all then parameters showing that they're adherent, that they're not taking drugs, they've been evaluated for every other disease that could possibly be causing this, and the reason they're having so much trouble is they have bad asthma. And here's the indication, and we ship it off with copies of the articles. And so far, we're batting a 1,000. Other than, I um, forget one company just flat out said, we won't pay for this ever. I was like, oh, well, that's a great conversation starter. So um, the other thing is we got the hospital buy into this. So flat out, it became approved. At the if you know anything about the University of Chicago, you can't get anything out of the capital budget cycle, which starts in January and ends January 31st. This was approved in April or close to that. Whoops. 
So I went to my chair of medicine and said, we have to have this. And as always, hospitals have money laying around somewhere, even when your hospital like mine is broke. And sure enough, they coughed up the dough, and we had it. And all I had to say to them was, if we don't get it first, someone else will. And that always makes my hospital jump. Um, we then got out, and we said referring. We talked to PR. We were on the news. We got the Tribune to do a big old thing that we wrote about what it was doing. They put it into the newspaper. Uh, I guess the folks at Asthmatics and Boston Scientific put a nice... Uh, ad there to uh, talk about it as well, but um, the media has worked. People are calling us, hey, I read about you in the paper. Hey, saw you on TV. I'm interested in this. And then I'll end with my case study. So we had a lady who comes with severe persistent asthmatic, despite documented adherence, high-dose inhaled steroid, lava, leukotriene modifiers. She's symptomatic four to six exacerbations per year, one to two hospitalizations. She's on prednisone above 20 milligrams. Anytime that occurs, she actually gets symptoms very similar to mania. She's almost been admitted to psych wards when she's been on high-dose prednisone. Her baseline FEV1 is 45% of predicted. She's a barrel-chested gas trapper with a normal diffusion capacity. We um, had a very long uh, informed consent with this nice lady. This is how miserable her life was. And I think my, my colleagues up here will echo this. You know, these folks, the ones who are really benefiting from this therapy, are also the ones that are definitively suffering the most. And as you think about it, take up the most time in your clinical practice. So she got evaluated. Her alpha one's normal. She IgE is normal. RAS study was normal. A negative anchor, CT chest. Her inspiratory and expiratory views showed mosaic patterns of airway collapse and gas trapping. She had an elevated ENO. Her vocal cord evaluation was normal, including multiple different phases of phonation. Her um, underwent baseline, a right middle lobe lavage for chronic infection, all negative. And, thermo and prior to thermoplasty, underwent uh, bronchoscopy with biopsies of multiple lower lobe carinas showing hypertrophied and thick and massive amounts of smooth muscle um, and a, and a dis disrupted epithelial layer, trichrome staining showing lots of amounts of smooth muscle. So she got all her regular treatment for thermoplasty and took her steroids, et cetera, nebulized lidocaine. This woman's airways are unbelievably concentrically narrowed. We cannot get out very far, and we were actually only able to do a meager amount of activation, secondary to the fact I couldn't get the catheter to go further than subsegment. Um, she was definitely way off the scale of norm. This is just some quick example. You'll see this is a, a diagnostic scope, not a therapeutic scope. And um, when we get out there, there's still some remnant left over from our biopsies. Um, when we deploy it, you'll see, those of you who know the size of the catheter, you'll see that we weren't, this is as far as I could get the scope. We're starting to almost wedge before you even get into the subsegment. And you've seen the procedure before. She also had fairly friable airways, and so a little bit barely touching her airways. You know, I mean, this is obviously not real bleeding, but it's still mucosally that it became inflamed just from touching. So her post FEV1 after procedure was 35%, but she had no conversational dyspnea, no wheezing, no hypoxia, no hemoptysis. She had a mild cough. She got admitted for observation more just because I think we were freaked out by the number. Um, she was discharged the next morning. Her last procedure was done in October of 2010. Her FEV1 is back to her baseline of 45%. She hasn't been on prednisone since. Um, she has not missed work since. And a quote from her last clinic note was, I'm more active, I'm able to cook again. She's actually a pretty good cook. She brings food to the clinic. Um, and then this is a biopsy um, uh, from one of her airways that we had treated. Um, and you'd seen before how, you know, hypertrophy and entangled. There's still some smooth muscle left. Um, but... The epithelial layer is not as disgustingly looking uh, destroyed, and there's definitely um, a reduction in smooth muscle, similar to what had been demonstrated prior uh, with um, uh, the canine model that, that Jerry demonstrated. Thank you.